Live service games nowadays shut down quicker than ever, but over the years, there have been a ton of forgotten games as well that are now lost to time. Back at the end of the Xbox 360 PS3 era, there was a game that released called Gotham City Imposters, and this was an interesting first-person shooter developed by Monolith Productions and published by Warner Bros. This game was interesting because it didn't have a physical release and was released digital only, originally behind a paywall, and just had this really interesting concept taking the formula of Call of Duty, but adding in different types of mechanics like costumes and gadgets and kind of like classes that you could use in-game. There was a little window where this game was hugely popular actually. A few months after the release of the game, it would release on Steam as a free-to-play game, which was also interesting. And while live service games technically weren't really a huge thing just yet, this game was kind of walking down the steps of becoming one of the earlier live service type games. A mix of the free-to-play-ness on PC and expansions coming out with like new maps being released for free and then cosmetics that you could actually buy, this game kind of almost had the formula ready to go early on. But while this game played somewhat like Call of Duty, it nowhere nearly was as popular as Call of Duty. And there's also a reason why there's a new Call of Duty game every year. The games do kind of get old after a while and there has to be a constant update with new experiences to keep people playing an FPS game like this long term. And Gotham City Imposters just was not that. When GameSpy, a service that was known for providing online connectivity in video games ended up shutting down, Gotham City Imposters was one of the games affected by this and was unavailable to play about two years after its release on PS3 and Xbox 360, and it didn't look like there were any plans to restore the game and move it to the next generation of consoles. The Steam version would survive for a few more years, though the player base never really ended up becoming all that big, still averaging a couple hundred players at all times, but you know, that's not really numbers to brag about. It wouldn't be until August of 2021 though when Gotham City Imposters was finally removed from Steam and it became no longer obtainable. Does anyone else remember the game Crossfire X? Yeah, that was a short-lived game. Now what's interesting is Crossfire is actually a really popular game over in the East. It's a lot like Counter-Strike. So Smilegate Entertainment ended up making a deal with Microsoft to create a new version that would work on consoles. They even brought on the team that worked on Alan Wake and Control to make a campaign. And when things started to come out about this game, it somewhat became a highly anticipated game, or at least some players of first-person shooter games were intrigued. In 2020, though, a open beta released for the game where Xbox insiders could try the game out, and it was interesting. Luke and I actually played this one when the beta came out, and then also when the game did release. But we remember actually having a decent time playing the beta. There was still probably a lot to be done with the game, and some things that needed to be polished up, but we were still interested to see what the full release of the game would look like. The game would get delayed a lot. It wouldn't be until early 2022 when the game would actually see a full release and an influx of players trying the game out. But despite the fact that it was free to play and a lot of players were jumping on board day one, a mix of not really the best gunplay or controls and weird pacing of the game caused a lot of players to kind of be like, oh, well, that was an experience of all time and turn the game off and stop playing. We really did want to like this game when it came out, but it felt really hard to get into this cycle of wanting to play the game, or like that feeling of, oh, I can just play one more. If I have a good game here, I'll have a good game again. I think it's where the pacing really came into play here. Sometimes you'll be playing on a very competitive map, like something out of Counter-Strike, and other times you're in like some giant location, like something out of Battlefield. Then there's like an infection mode with invisible enemies or something, and that mode was fun at first until you realize the mechanics were kind of broken and it became more frustrating than fun when people were exploiting some of the mechanics. There weren't a lot of maps, not a lot of content or things to do, and the player base practically just plummeted. The game hadn't even been out a year yet when they announced that they would be shutting down the game altogether. And a few months later, this game was closed down and just becomes this weird memory that you might look back at and be like, did that even happen? Is that real? And yeah, it was real. Okay, for this next one, a lot of you probably haven't thought about this game in years. You probably forgot it even existed, and when I say it, it's gonna like unlock some secret core 
memory you forgot all about, but Doritos Crash Course. This game was amazing. It was free to play, and it was essentially like the TV show Wipeout, except you run as your Xbox avatar, and whatever outfit you have on your avatar, that's what you see in this thing. There were a bunch of stages, you could race with your friends, it was a good time. But here's the thing that not a lot of people even realized existed, there was a sequel known as Doritos Crash Course 2 that came out on the Xbox One back in the early days, and it was literally one of the worst 180s on a game that I've ever seen. Doritos Crash Course was cool because it was a free to play game that you could just tell your friends to go download real quick and you had a great time playing alongside other friends. This game was not like that. While the game was free to an extent, you really only had access to like the first world or first level and maybe like one or two stages and then everything else was paywalled. Besides that, there were microtransactions for things like avatar effects, power ups and other types of things. And man, it just ruined the entire legacy of Doritos Crash Course, a gem of the Xbox 360, just to have a very malicious sequel come out that was supposedly going to be the platform for more levels and stages down the road, but never ended up existing very long. I think due to the lack of popularity, the servers were shut down in just about a year after the game released, with the whole game getting delisted as well. Hey Luke, what's this in the script about Family Guy Online? Hey Family Guy Online was a game that uh, I played a little bit and it was Family Guy themed. And I know the concept kind of seems weird, like a Family Guy MMO, but if you think back to 2003 and you remember Simpsons Hit and Run, the Simpsons came in, they kind of made a GTA clone and the game actually was pretty good. So I think the thought process here was take the Family Guy IP and make an MMO. And they did do that. And it was honestly very basic. It actually kind of just felt like the shell of an MMO. It felt really repetitive really quickly. And honestly, this game shut down less than a year after release and I don't think uh, anyone really misses it or missed it. Also, I don't think anyone was like, this is gonna be the next WoW killer. Battlefield's another interesting game here that's tried to make the jump into a live service type game for quite some time in a free to play type format. We're not talking about the mobile game that they were working on that they ended up canceling. Back in 2009, DICE and Easy Studios worked on a free to play spinoff of Battlefield known as Battlefield Heroes, which was designed to take take on some of the similarities of the Battlefield series, but be designed for less demanding computer specifications. And while the game was free, it was supported completely through microtransactions and interestingly enough, advertising? The websites associated with the game, there would be ads. You could also spend money to get cool things for your character's avatar or even buy stronger weapons, which you know, that's not a slippery slope into having a pay to win type game. Now back in 2009, I wasn't really big on PC gaming, so I never even knew that this game existed. But this game definitely was at least a little bit ahead of its time with the whole free to play, but play to earn or pay to earn progression system built into the pricing model of the game. But this was just one part of EA's bigger plan at trying to have more free to play experiences for PC players. Besides this, there was a Battlefield Play for Free game that came out two years later, also under the whole Play for Free initiative that they were going for. This one also was developed by DICE and Easy Studios again. And while built on a modified version of the Battlefield 2 game, this game took on the modern setting that was really popular in the early 2010s. And this game actually did get some decent updates after its release for a while. There were customization options added in for weapons, new maps were added, Added, and there was a big push to balance out a lot of the weapons. While this game wasn't perfect at launch, it did get better progressively over time, but I think the fact that the name of the game was Battlefield Play for Free kind of just feels like a very freemium type name for a game. And as time moved forward and new Battlefield games were releasing, also on PC, I think those just became the more popular options because they were newer. Both Battlefield Heroes and Battlefield Play for Free would have their servers shut down in April of 2015. Also, during that day, there were two other free-to-play experiences under EA that were being shut down as well. Need for Speed World, which was like a MMO take on the Need for Speed Racing series, which was one game that was noted as having a pretty strong start, but eventually turned into essentially a pay-to-win racing game, where if you wanted to get the fastest cars, you just had to buy them with real money. And then there was FIFA World, which was like a free-to-play 
MMO soccer football game. This one only saw a worldwide release in 2014, so it shutting down just a year later in 2015 was kind of surprising. But this game never actually saw the full commercial launch and just seemed to be kind of in different phases of alphas and betas before ultimately getting closed down with EA stating that the team just didn't have enough momentum to bring the game to a full commercial launch. These four games were kind of some of the biggest games in the EA play for free type campaign that they were doing. And these are kind of the last games of the whole play for free moniker, though the play for free stuff had kind of been dying down even years before these games were discontinued. Battleforge was an online card based RTS game that released in 2009, though was discontinued in 2013. Lord of Ultima was a free to play browser game that was a mix of like an MMO RTS with 2D strategy. That came out in 2010 and actually had a decent sized community despite the fact that the game maybe wasn't the most lucrative thing for EA. Fans are actually pretty upset when this game ended up shutting down and there was a Kickstarter made by fans of Lord of Ultima to essentially recreate the game and it was funded in just 17 minutes and the remake ended up becoming the game Crown of Gods which focused on recreating the gameplay that everyone loved but obviously using different artwork and lore because they didn't want to get slapped with a big old lawsuit from EA. We speculate that EA shut this project down because they wanted to focus on a new Ultima project, Ultima Forever Quest for the Avatar. It was supposedly a free-to-play cross-platform game that ended up releasing on iOS and was shut down pretty much exactly a year after its release in 2014. Now if we go back even earlier into EA's timeline, we can look at the game The Sims Online. Once again, another MMO variation of the original The Sims, though this game wasn't free-to-play. It was released to retailers in 2002, maybe taking inspiration from other popular MMO games like World of Warcraft, this game had a subscription fee linked to it as well, requiring players to pay $9.99 a month for access. I think The Sims Online didn't do very well because the game just seemed a whole lot more watered down than a standard Sims experience. It was just a weird single player game in an online environment. And then in a weird move, EA decided that they were going to rebrand the entire game as EA Land. I guess the big idea was if they couldn't develop their game to be cool enough for players to enjoy, why don't we make the players develop the game to make it cooler to enjoy? And essentially rolled out a massive update that allowed players to upload user created content. They can import their own .jpeg images, IFF files, BMP files. You can add things like sculptures, decorations, and multi-tiled tables. And while they're at it, the new development team just kind of combined some cities, rebranded the game, erased player data, you know, all the normal stuff. Is anyone surprised this game shut down a year later? One of the most interesting games to be super popular just to fall off really hard was The Matrix Online. Now, I remember this game having a lot of hype and excitement about it. Of course, The Matrix movies played a big part in people being excited about this project and when the MMO launched it was kind of average. I still think there were a lot of people who jumped on board with the game trying to experience it and enjoy the creation of the Matrix but in an online MMO type format. But I think with all of the buzz and excitement about this and the mix of a lot of MMOs being out at this time, it was 2005, and the last two Matrix movies maybe not doing as well, honestly the player base kind of just tanked off. It seemed like there were a lot of efforts to try to keep the game going for a while, but finally, four years later in 2009, Sony decided to pull the plug on the game, citing the low subscription numbers to the game itself, as at the time, apparently, it only had fewer than 500 active players online. There was kind of a little bit of a resurgence in interest during the final days of the game, which is kind of neat. People who once were really invested in the game coming back to see what they once played and had good memories of, but ultimately, this game was yeah, dead. And before we end the segment about Matrix Online, there's actually one more fun story about Matrix Online, and that is that they actually kill off Morpheus in the game. That actually is canon and that's why morpheus wasn't in the new matrix movie because they killed him off in this forgotten life service game which is kind of weird okay now let's look at a tragically recent game that actually is shutting down 
Gundam Evolution. I'll be honest, the announcement that this game was being shut down was pretty surprising. I mean, Gundam is a hugely popular IP, and while the gameplay was pretty much an Overwatch clone, this game kind of released right in the prime time where Overwatch was becoming less popular and there was a lot of criticism surrounding Overwatch, so there was kind of a demand for something new but similar that players could try out and get a different experience. It was free to play, it was accessible, and hey, who doesn't like fighting robots? Now, early on when you start playing the game, it doesn't really feel all that bad. This was one that Luke and I played right after the console release on Xbox Series X, and the gameplay honestly wasn't really all that bad, though there was definitely a need for some fixes and tweaks to balance out the game, but the problem really lied in the pipeline of content and balance fixes being very, very slow, while so much of the game was paywalled and covered in microtransactions. The free-to-play progression was really slow, it just drove a lot of players away from this game, which made the people who did want to still play the game have harder times finding other players, and things just quickly imploded on itself. Now, this game was fully playable on most platforms by November of 2022, and just barely six months later, it was announced that this game was shutting down. And if you still want to play this game, you have until November of 2023, and then that's it. I think this game could have been so much more if just the vision was a little bit different and more consumer-oriented versus, you know, what we got. Okay, so we wanted to play this game before the servers fully shut down, and we got on, and we played in a lobby together for 90 minutes. We didn't really play. We sat there waiting for a game for 90 minutes. We were just talking. We almost forgot that we were even queued up in this game altogether. We were actually getting off of our call to go get food or something. We we're going to regroup and maybe play something else. And we finally got put into a game. We were confused. We jumped back to our Xboxes to get on and play this epic battle. And uh, we picked our characters. And then the game was canceled because someone disconnected. That was our last experience playing this game. Yeah. Club Penguin is another game that a lot of people probably already know the life and death of because of how popular this game still was even at the time of its closure. Essentially, this game defined a lot of 2000 kids experiences. You were a penguin, you could have an igloo, you could have a puffle, there were tons of mini games and some secret group of ninjas or something that everyone wanted to be a part of. There was always that one guy saying that you could flip the iceberg if everyone stood over on one side, which it did eventually flip. And unfortunately, it seemed like Disney wanted to revitalize the Club Penguin brand and had worked on developing a brand new mobile game experience experience, maybe to compete with the likes of Roblox, which was both on PC and mobile. So they shut down the Club Penguin servers, though it seemed like there were efforts to revive that that were controversial. The new Club Penguin experience, Club Penguin Island, died after a year. Nobody liked it. Okay, so before there was Ghost Recon Wildlands, there was a free-to-play Ubisoft game for the Microsoft Windows called Ghost Recon Phantoms. It sounds pretty spooky. Um, I don't think it really was. It was like a third-person MOBA-like experience that came out in the early 2010s. Once again, another game trying to support itself completely on microtransactions. And surprisingly enough, this game was also announced for the Wii U of all places. Before the Wii U launch, Ubisoft was very invested in what Nintendo was doing with the Wii U, and Zombie U was even a launch title for the Wii U, a Ubisoft revival of sorts. Uh, that game didn't sell well, and I think that led Ubisoft to rethink their whole involvement with the Wii U moving forward, especially with the PC side of things having its own issues nonetheless. This one didn't take long before Ubisoft announced that they would be shutting down the service due to a slow but declining player base in the game, and probably because of other plans to use the Ghost Recon franchise moving forward. There's no denying that World of Warcraft was massive popular in the 2000s and really peaked towards the end of the 2000s. And with that game being as lucrative as it was, I think there were a ton of game studios and publishers that wanted to try to make the game that would be the new MMO that players who got tired of World of Warcraft would eventually move on to. I think that's why we always see so many MMOs rise and fall quickly, especially in the 2010 era. But one of the bigger ones was the game Wildstar, which originally was going to do the whole subscription thing like World of Warcraft has, but then later changed to a free-to-play model. To make this game even more appealing, it was actually developed by 17 former members of Blizzard Entertainment who made a studio known as Carbine Studios. They were quoted even saying they wanted to make anything but WoW, and using their experience with the MMOs, they thought that this would be a perfect team to make the biggest thing moving forward. Here's what's really interesting here though. The game released and it wasn't actually bad. It was mostly received well. It wasn't a masterpiece by 
by any means at all. And I think a lot of people really did enjoy the game when they first got into it. I think the real problem though was the oversaturation of the MMO market and this game not doing anything to drastically separate itself from the competition. A lot of reviewers looked at this game and compared it directly to World of Warcraft and thought it's good but not World of Warcraft good. And since people at this point were really looking for a game that could beat World of Warcraft and take that crown, this game just wasn't there and eventually players started to bleed off but then some core mechanics that were very standard in like the MMO genre at this point were altered just to make this game try to stand out a bit like you could PvP anyone anywhere as long as they're in another faction and marketed the raids as like the most hardcore experience where there was two raid instances for 20 player groups and 40 player groups which I guess was just really hard to coordinate there. It was four years after its release where it was announced that the studio would be closing down and they would begin the process of winding Wildstar down which would then shut off at the end of 2018. You know a lot of people nowadays talk about Saints Row and how that game inevitably led to the closure of Volition as the remake wasn't really up to par but there was some other problems that Volition was having a couple of years earlier. The existence of Agents of Mayhem probably contributed to the decline in trust between the fan base that they had acquired over the years with games like Red Faction and Saints Row to its ultimate culmination of just bad reception with the Saints Row remake. I don't even know where to begin with this game. Agents of Mayhem was really weird. Agents of Mayhem released in 2017 and was essentially a brand new IP set in the multiverse of Saints Row and Red Faction and it was like a multiplayer action world adventure game. There's like 12 players and then you're split up into groups. Each character had its own playstyle and its own personalities and there was a ton of crossover with Saints Row and later Red Faction. The thing was I think just not a lot of people cared when this game released. It was already different enough from Saints Row and it was marketed explicitly as a non-Saints Row game until it seemed like maybe interest wasn't high enough and then they were like oh no it's totally Saints Row related and started showing off all like the Saints Row tie-ins. The game released and the reviews were mixed to positive but the sales were really really not all that good. This caused this game to very quickly go on like very low priced sales. I think a lot of people who experienced this game probably picked it up for a few dollars after the initial launch and then tried it and saw that the game was mostly inactive already and abandoned it. I never really spent too much time playing this game, but if you did, let me know in the comments what it was really like to be a player of this game. Was it fun? Was the gameplay actually good? Or was this more of a misfire from Volition and Deep Silver? Speaking of misfires, Battleborn. Does anyone remember this game? 2016, a MOBA hero shooter releases known as Battleborn. No, this isn't Overwatch, though it did release right around the same time as Overwatch. And despite having the leg up releasing just a couple of weeks before, the gameplay being somewhat complicated and Overwatch just seemingly seeming more appealing to the general masses, tied to the fact that Overwatch was much easier to pick up and play on day one without having a serious learning curve, meant that Battleborn kind of slipped under the radar really quickly and a lot of the players that did try the game out kind of fell off. I mean, it was pretty obvious that Blizzard Entertainment had a much bigger budget to burn through when promoting Overwatch, so the closeness in release dates was somewhat interesting that they still went ahead with Battleborn. Still, there was a little bit of a player base early on who enjoyed this game, and there were talks about this game maybe making the jump to free-to-play, which would be a format that would work at least better than not going free-to-play for games like Paladins, for example. Instead, they chose not to do this and doubled down and released downloadable content until way later on in 2017, finally adding a free trial mode, which did not include the game's story missions. Not that that was the main draw for people with Battleborn. The game only launched with 12,000 people on PC playing, and by July, just two months later, there were less than a thousand people still playing this game. By the one year mark, there were sometimes less than a hundred players during off-peak hours. By the end of 2017, they announced that the game would be entering maintenance mode, effectively shutting down any further development, but there would be a small team remaining to fix up any server issues or critical bugs that might come up, and then in 2019 it was announced that the game servers would be completely shut down, which 
closed down in January of 2021. Okay, I really want to talk about Knockout City for a second. I'll be honest, I really loved Knockout City because this was a game I played and thoroughly enjoyed. I was very impressed with how Knockout City captured the idea of dodgeball in a cool setting in a non-intrusive cosmetic microtransaction type of way after the game went free to play. But yeah, this game was pretty fun and the new updates were cool as well. So it came to a surprise when it was announced that this game would be shutting down. The biggest flaw that happened with Knockout City was unfortunately the fact that the game was paywalled to play and it had a pretty steep price tag and a lot of people didn't know what they were getting into so there was no real desire to try this game out. Had this game launched as free to play, I think it would have still had a community playing it now because there would have been a lot of buzz about the game, people talking about the game and trying it out for the first time. And while not everyone trying the game out would love it, word of mouth does travel well for a free game. And yeah, it's a shame that this game ended up closing down. This is one I would go back and play now if it was still available. It wasn't fully perfect. Sometimes it felt like you would hit the buttons and it wouldn't respond correctly to you catching the ball or something. And that could be really frustrating, but it was still all in all a solid game. It was probably one of the better games on this list, to be honest. Speaking of games that recently closed down, on the other hand, we have games like Rumbleverse. This was also a game that Luke and I played and it was not good. I don't know, Luke and I tried to play this game back in the day when it came out and it was weird. You ran around in this battle royale setting and you're supposed to fight, but the fighting felt really unbalanced and there's power-ups and it was just weird how the whole thing worked. It was never very clear, like if you're winning or losing the fight and it seemed like these fights would drag on for an extensively long time. I think the player base was already dropping off incredibly fast right after its launch. So it wasn't really too surprising that this one would shut down either. Also, this game released really late compared to the craze of battle royale games and it was just really not that polished and then really late to the party. Speaking of late to the party, Hyperscape released in 2020 and that was Ubisoft's response to the blow up of PUBG and Fortnite and I guess later on Apex. But yeah, at this point in 2020, not only was there PUBG, Fortnite, Apex, and now Warzone all released as battle royale games, let alone all the other games that had quick turnarounds like Realm Royale that fell off, that like cuisine battle royale game that gets renamed every once in a while. Okay, so all these battle royales already exist. And then Hyperscape comes out. Hyperscape was late to the party, so if people were gonna be interested, it was gonna have to be a very impressive game. This game though, leaned into like the whole futuristic type feel to it and there were different weapons and special abilities. Some things were kind of goofy, like you could turn into a giant ball or something. Then it was like painted in this whole like actual arena type thing and there's like a AI host that like changes the modifications of the game and viewers on Twitch are supposed to have some interactivity with it. It was an okay concept and the game was just bam, randomly and unexpectedly dropped. But the game ultimately was just kind of received as mid tier. I mean, some people had fun with it. It was like an average game, but like there are so many other battle royales out there that people were already more invested in and this game didn't push the boundaries or do anything massively different and the game ended up shutting down about 16 months after its launch. Let's talk about the Marvel Avengers game by Crystal Dynamics who had a good track record. They did the Tomb Raider remakes that were pretty good and when this game was first announced <laughs> it looked a little goofy but after some delays polishing things up the game was looking pretty promising and it seemed very story oriented despite the fact that it was going to be an online live service type game. I played a little bit of this one. It was pretty okay. The story was enough to kind of draw me in early enough. The real problem though was the gameplay felt really, really repetitive. Despite the fact that there's different characters you can play as, at the end of the day, you're just doing the same things over and over again. Just spamming your attacks, moving area to area, and that was it. It was a little bit better if you could do co-op gameplay, and that was kind of nice. And, and some of the characters felt really good to play. Maybe not Spider-Man PlayStation 4 level of precision and tightness to the feel, but passable. I think this one really just came down to the gameplay really just being a beat-em-up that wasn't too engaging. I do think there was a good effort here, just not enough to keep this game alive, and they tried to do all types of things to get people interested in this game again. There was tie-in media, there was post-release content, and while I didn't play any of the DLC other than the Hawkeye one, apparently the Black Panther one was really, really good. Then there was this like Spider-Man tie-in with PlayStation only. Like I said, they tried everything to try to get these things 
turned around with this game in more interest, but I think the player base just kept bleeding off. And this game really wanted to support itself with cosmetic design. You can tell there was all these suits that you could buy and they were pretty cool. A little pricey, but cool nonetheless. Finally though, after a solid effort at trying to get this game up to par and make the game a better experience, they announced earlier on this year that the game would be closing down and the game did close down a couple of days ago, matter of fact. Okay, and then there was Jump Force, which was a crossover fighting game featuring characters that are really iconic. Now, I'll be honest, I'm kind of brand new when it comes to anime, so I don't know how significant this game was when it was first announced. So I'm gonna let Luke talk about it for a second. Uh, Luke? You know when they announced that Jump Force would be having all these IPs tied to it, like One Piece, I think JoJo, Dragon Ball Z, Bleach, Yu-Gi-Oh! I thought it was really cool. And I thought a crossover game with these massive IPs could be a huge hit. But boy, was I wrong. And I do think one thing that turned off the most people was all the clips they saw of this game's art style and it looked like poo poo you have an anime game with all these anime characters and you try to make a realistic art style what were they smoking and it's just the surface of all the other issues with the game the gameplay was shallow and you know fighting games usually have huge skill gaps but this game just didn't have that and the story was generic as hell it could have been written by jet gpd if you ask me and then also i do have to say you know the little switch and bait with death note characters being in there but none of them are actually playable they're just star characters. They couldn't at least have made Ryuk playable? Bro's a Shinigami, he can't throw hands with Yugi Moto? I don't like that. And there was a new influx of characters over time, but I don't think it really boosted any sales or helped the game maintain a player base. And then in early 2022, it was taken off the market for purchase. And then in August of 2022, the online servers were also turned offline. And if you bought the game before they took it off sale, you can actually still play it, just not online. Call of Duty Warzone is a really interesting one to include here, but man is it weird. Call of Duty has a track record of, at the very least, leaving their old game servers online. You can boot up an old Xbox 360 and still play Call of Duty 3 online if you really wanted to, but with Modern Warfare 2019, things honestly started getting really messy. March 2020, a new free-to-play battle royale known as Warzone was released within the Modern Warfare 2019 client, which meant that everyone wanting to play it would have to download Modern Warfare 2019, either buying it with a base game or just playing the Warzone part of the game. All cosmetics, though, were shared, so it wasn't too confusing. Later that year, though, Black Ops Cold War released, and instead of moving the Battle Royale over there, they kept it in the Modern Warfare 2019 client and essentially backported Black Ops Cold War weapons into the game's Battle Royale. All new cosmetics would only work for the BR side of Modern Warfare 2019 and then over in Cold War separately. Okay, then Call of Duty Vanguard came out, and with it a brand new Battle Royale map to replace the old one, once again, Vanguard's Battle Royale update would be applied to the Modern Warfare 2019 client, and that old map, Verdansk, was sunsetted. You could no longer play on it, starting with the release of Vanguard. But all your cosmetics from over the years were at least still in the BR side of things, and new ones would carry over to Vanguard. It was an unpopular decision to make the original map unavailable, but other games like Fortnite had sunsetted maps before and lived on, so whatever, right? Then things took a worse turn though when Modern Warfare 2 2022 released and they decided to update the Battle Royale mode again with another new map and overhaul features and include this version in the base game of Modern Warfare 2 2022. So for the first time ever, there was no need if you're a Battle Royale player to have the 2019 client but all of your progression and cosmetics from three years of play was now essentially gone in the new game. Confusing, I know, but at the very least, you could go back and play the old Warzone, despite on the Vanguard era map. That was the case though, until recently, when Activision announced that the old Warzone altogether would no longer be playable. Yeah, Modern Warfare 2019, only the Battle Royale side would be completely offline. Now this obviously came to a surprise to many because Call of Duty's track record of at least keeping their old games online, but in what we guess is a move to try to force players to play Warzone 2, and also with Modern Warfare 3 set to release utilizing some or most of the Modern Warfare 2 2022 client, it seems like the old BR is just being left in the dust. Matter of fact, they're even rebranding Modern Warfare 2 2022 
to Call of Duty HQ, or at least that's what it seems like they're doing already. It's just weird that a game as popular as Warzone and Modern Warfare 2019 falls victim to becoming a dead live service game just two and a half years after the service was even started, just to be replaced with essentially the same thing with less investment from players that they've worked for over the years. Probably a move to make more money. Anyone remember the MMO Defiance? No? Well, does anyone remember the TV show with the same name? Also no? Well, Defiance was an ambitious project where they developed a TV show and an MMO at the same time as closely as possible. They went in with the goal that both mediums would influence each other over time. For example, like a character would appear in the game and then a few episodes later he would be seen in the TV show. To achieve this, they spent a ton of time on world building and the whole lore surrounding this universe and wanted the world to constantly evolve as the seasons progress. Both the game and TV show would launch in April of 2013 and prior to the release there were reports that the whole project was already costing sci-fi up to 100 million US dollars. Upon release the TV show got decent reviews, nothing too high, but a lot of review sites like IGN for example pointed out that there was potential in the show even though it was rough around the edges. Now they actually gave the game a lower score than the TV show which is surprising even though they noted that the world was cool and the TV show integration was neat. Now those were only the initial reviews and the TV show actually kept getting better over time and the MMO support actually seemed decent as well. To also further this whole MMO TV show integration, they did do a contest where one player's character from the MMO would be picked to appear in the TV show, which that was kind of cool. I couldn't find whose character appeared or when they appeared, but there's a promo for this contest, so someone must have won, I hope. If you are the one winning this contest, please contact us. I would like to hear how that went. Anyways, after the TV show kept getting better, the MMO kept getting support, it all fell apart in 2015, when after three seasons of the TV show, it was officially canceled due to the decline in viewership and the high production cost that was keeping this whole project alive. Life. The MMO would still get updates though, and the story elements that were planned for season 4 of the TV show would actually be worked into the game instead. In 2017, the game would also be ported to next gen, specifically PlayStation 4, and rebranded itself to Defiance 2050. Later this version would also come to PC and Xbox, and Defiance 2050 would also launch free to play, after the original game also went free to play in 2014, one year after that original game launch. I remember buying this game after it went free to play in 2014 at GameStop, and it was like 3 euros or something it was like bottom of the bin type stuff and i did actually play it a little bit and i kind of enjoyed it the gameplay felt nice i really enjoyed the world and at that point i had never seen the tv show and i was still interested in the lore and the universe i never really went back though after 2014 but the mmo did stay active for a couple years before it was announced that the game would shut down two years ago in 2021 now it's been more than 10 years since the original launch of defiance and I do have to say, there hasn't really been anything like this. There have been movies and TV shows based on video games, but nothing on the level of Defiance influencing both a TV show and the game at the same time. It was a cool project, but something that not a lot of people fully know about, and in the end, it wasn't a great success. So chances are, we will never see a project like this again. Now I don't want to talk too much about mobile games for this video because mobile games come and go often and we really want to talk more about the live service massive games, but there is something to say about the game Dragalia Lost which was published by Nintendo and Nintendo was really making a big push in the late 2010s to try to have a bigger presence on mobile devices and essentially Dragalia Lost was like their new IP for mobile devices. This was like a Nintendo staple, essentially, and Nintendo would have a presence in other games down the road on the mobile side of things, like Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, Mario Run, Mario Kart, Fire Emblem, you get the idea. But it seemed like this era of Nintendo's interest in mobile devices really started to slow down in the early 2020s, and Dragalia Lost, despite being one of the earliest games to release, would be the first one fully announced to be discontinued in November of 2022. While its popularity had definitely slowed down a bit, it still seemed to be a game that a lot of people liked, so it was a bit of a shock to see this game officially just be announced that it was ending altogether. It's uncertain if we'll ever see a resurrection of this IP ever again, but the fact that we didn't see any representation of Dragalia back when Super Smash Bros. Ultimate released probably means that this game isn't really a top contender either. Okay, now hear me out because I'm not sure if this one actually should count for this list, but, but hear me out first and then let me know in the comments if this should count for this video or not. 
Destiny 2. Imagine that it's early 2019, and after hearing buzz about how much better Destiny 2 is now that the new expansion Forsaken had released, you decide to go and pick up the game at the store. Yes, they sold physical bundles that included the base game of Destiny 2, the two DLC stories, and the new Forsaken expansion for $60, but let's say life happens and you don't get around to the game until 2022 but you decide to finally pop the game in, and after a big update, you really have nothing. Yeah, Destiny 2 did something pretty unprecedented for a game that is so heavily marketed to console gamers and PC gamers alike, but the original base campaign, The Red War, was vaulted, the two DLC stories, vaulted, and the Forsaken campaign were also vaulted and as of today, you can no longer play that content at all. So if you jumped on board in 2018 or 2019, for example, you essentially would just have the same access as all the free players have, which is actually very minimum. I mean, if you had to buy everything and anything, you're looking at spending upwards of 150 to maybe $200, if not more. That's a lot of money. It was a pretty controversial move to sunset so much content that was in the base version of the game and the first expansion, and this just falls into this weird example of a live service game cannibalizing its own content. And while other MMOs have technically sunsetted content too, this one just felt very different coming from the format that it was in. So I was unsure if this one counts, but you can tell me whether or not it should. I'm just not a fan of sunsetting stuff, obviously. Well, these were our picks for the biggest flops or online services that are no longer available to play. It is kind of interesting looking at these games and being like, wow, these things are completely gone now, where some games still exist to an extent like Anthem. I mean, you can play it, you can spend money in the microtransactions store or whatever, but uh, there's no new content coming, but hey, it's still playable. These other games are gone mostly for good, so which game do you feel like had the worst roll of the dice? Let us know in the comments down below. Make sure you subscribe with notifications on. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our channel. If you want to have your name in our videos like these people have, uh, maybe consider throwing a few bucks our way on our Patreon. That'd be kind of cool. All right, that's it for today. We'll see you guys next time with a brand new video.